Analysis paralysis is where you dig into a, a topic or a conversation or a point and it's so complex and you really start digging down into it to the extent that there's just so much information that you are paralyzed from taking a decision, taking an action. Hashtag just ask, don't grab. It brought awareness to that interaction between the sighted and the blind. It should be such a simple thing. There is so much going on, and that's what makes the whole thing so complicated. The next corner could be that person that wants to win their good deed for the day and help you. You, I don't want to say the helpless, <laughs> but <laughs> that word gets used. You might well get yourself into a whole lot of trouble using a term like that, because it's one thing we are not. We don't even realize that they don't even think we're capable of or have the confidence to do something. Not confidence, but the capacity sometimes even to do something. One moment where two people engage, bump into each other, start having a conversation or not, start having some form of interaction. You mentioned the golden rules. What three golden rules would there be for society to know about when they come across us? And that's a great question for the listeners. Oh, isn't it just? Wouldn't it be great to have, you know, the three golden rules of a moment in time between a member of the BVI community and a sighted individual? It would be so great if we could just put it down into three golden rules. And it would be good to, to hear other people's thoughts about what they felt would help. I don't know what happened. I don't know why he was there, but I was glad he was there. So just grab, don't ask, <laughs> worked for me at that moment. Analysis paralysis. A moment in time between a member of the BVI community and a sighted individual. With host Lois Strauchan and Jeff Thompson. Welcome to Blind Abilities. I'm Jeff Thompson, and today in the studio we have Lois Throken, and she is the author of A Different Way of Seeing and has the podcast A Different Way of Traveling. How are you doing, Lois? I'm good, thank you, Jeff, and yourself? Good. It is traveling, not travel, right? It is traveling. There we go. Even more complicated, it's spelt with two L's. Really? Yes, because that's how we spell it here in South Africa. We've been talking about this topic, and it's not analysis paralysis, but we seem to have reached that point sometimes, and we decided just to bring it out to you about the intersection of the blind and the sighted people out in public. And some of this has stemmed from Dr. Amy Kavanaugh's hashtag, just ask, don't grab. And that was a great campaign that over in UK, and it reached around the world about people touching or stepping in on someone's bubble and acting in a way that was inappropriate, just disregarding our own integrity as a person. And it, it got pretty popular. It's one of those things that it should be such a simple thing, that moment of, of interaction between a member of the blind or visually impaired community and a member of the sighted community. But if you dig down below the surface, it actually lands up being a really complicated, there's, there's just so much going on at that instant when something happens and it can just turn out in so many different ways. And there's so many different factors that come into play there. And when you said reaction, I think typically in a situation that I'm in, all of a sudden there's this question that is projected at me and I turn to it and I react to that question and I may be at an intersection ready to proceed across. Now, I may have traveled six miles to get to this point, but to this person, it might be their Boy Scout moment or their moment of good deed for the day, or it they just might be curious. And my reaction could set the next course of this intersection between me and the person. We all have stories of what can often be very bizarre, sometimes funny, sometimes quite difficult moments where something happens. And it can be someone, and I'm going to use quite a strong word, invading our space because they think they're trying to help, or 
not. And, you know, how that moment goes, how it turns out really depends on how we react. It depends on how they react. It depends on the environment, the context in which it's taking place. But I think every single blind and visually impaired person can tell story after story after story of those moments, those instances. And I think it's important that we have campaigns like Dr. Kavanaugh's because, yeah, there, there's so much that we want sighted people to know and understand or to realize about our world. And just sometimes they do and sometimes they don't. Sometimes we can teach them a little bit more about our skills, our abilities, what we are and are not able to do. But sometimes those moments just go completely pear-shaped. Exactly. It's sometimes a domino effect of how we react, how they react. Hopefully, we have enough confidence or enough patience at the time. We may be in a hurry to get somewhere. There may be so many different things happening at that moment that not the best of scenarios come out of it. But as someone who travels quite a bit, sometimes explores, yeah, I might be out exploring in a newer area where I may welcome that question. And I appreciate that sometimes. And sometimes I'm wearing that right on me, that, that look of the lost puppy. It might be obvious. So sometimes we have to be aware of what are we doing? How are we carrying ourselves? How are we traveling? Are our skills up to snuff? Are we just out practicing? And that may be something that we want to relate to the person during that educational moment that sometimes happens when we get confronted or we are jarred out of our concentration of all the white noise we're paying attention to, everything. And all of a sudden this voice comes in and it's like screeching halt. What? A question. And we get that situation. So it's how we react, how they react. And it's very nice when we do have that, like you mentioned, that moment to educate, the moment to say how we do things. And if you got that, if it's a long light, if it's a cab ride or a bus ride or something where we have that moment. And those are great moments. And I think Dr. Amy Kavanaugh brought that out because a lot of sighted people shared that hashtag just ask, don't grab. It brought awareness to that interaction between the sighted and the blind. It would be so nice if it were just easy enough that we could say there are three golden rules that sighted people should know that make these moments, these interactions simple, painless for everyone and safe. But it doesn't always work like that because I can think of moments where I've been in a situation and to be honest, I have needed the person to reach out and physically touch me maybe not grab, but catch my attention that maybe it's not possible to do with the voice. That in those moments that have saved me from putting myself in danger, they don't always happen often. In fact, the more skilled I am in navigating my way around my world using either my white cane or my guide dog, I don't need that, that kind of help. But the sighted person doesn't always know that. And they truly believe that they are helping even when they're not. And yeah, like I said, it would be great if we could have three golden rules that all sighted people should know. But every single moment, experience, instance is going to be different and depend on a whole bunch of different factors. As I've gained more mobility skills and learned more about my area that I live in or that I navigate on a daily basis, you would think my confidence level was really very high, and it typically is, but every once in a while there's that new bus driver, the new cashier, the new someone that just started working in the area that I have a new intersection with. And no matter how stealthy or great ninja warrior <laughs> cane user I feel that I am, you just have those moments. And sometimes, sometimes it goes good, and sometimes... I'm the culprit. 29 times out of 30, I'm a great ambassador for the blind, visually impaired community. And every once in a while, they catch me on that one <laughs> moment, and I come back with a comment or something. that I do not help the situation. And that haunts me. And I, I believe I'm up to like 69 out of 70 now. But it just haunts me because I keep on thinking, what could I have I done differently one, one instance is I paid for something at the store. I was with my son, and as I approached the cashier, I don't know if I asked, is this the, my debit card or is this a 20 or something of that nature? 
I don't know if she thought we were a team at that point because she watched that happen. But after I paid for it, she handed the receipt to my son and I kept holding my hand there like, can I have my receipt? I gave it to him. And at that moment, I just said, but I paid for it. Why didn't I get that? You know, I confronted her on that. And yet, maybe I gave her a lot of cues that we are a team. I ask him what's in my wallet. I ask him what's in my hand. It, so it was probably, I probably led her to do what she did, and she felt fine about it. But it's still, to this day, I still think of that moment that, why did I fall that direction when I could have just easily have said, ah, great, well, you have a good, you know, it, it's just one of those moments that just happens sometimes. I really don't think you should lose sleep over that. I mean, there could be so many reasons, and they may have absolutely nothing to do with your cues that you gave her. It could have been entirely hers. I, we, we just never know, because we can't get inside someone else's brain and figure out what their motivations are for the actions that they have. We just, we just can't. Well, the best we can do is just deal with the situation that as it arises and move on and then let it go. Unless we've done something specifically that has caused it. I mean, I, I can remember a, a situation. I was traveling from Cape Town to Johannesburg here in South Africa, and I was traveling by air and traveling with my guide dog, Fiji. And everything had gone great. Um, the, the woman who was assisting me, who was um, accompanying us to make certain we got to the right gate, she did absolutely everything was brilliant until kind of I was waiting they called our flight and everybody stood up and started heading to the the desk to go and board the plane and I didn't have anyone there to help me and I was getting quite anxious about it and a fellow passenger saw that I was standing up waiting because I was now on my feet with my guide dog with my bag and my, I was ready to go and he turned around and he said would you like me to walk with you I said yes please because I should board first because it's easier for my guide dog at which point the, the woman from the passenger assist unit who was meant to be assisting me came up and she said to me, you're not boarding first, we're boarding you last. And I'm afraid I wasn't as polite as you were in the situation in, that, in the store. I kind of lost it and told her that wasn't the policy. It wasn't the way it was supposed to go. I was supposed to board first and she didn't react well to my response. And if I had been able to take a step back, take a deep breath, squash down those feelings of irritation and say, thanks, this is actually what would work easier for me. How can we work together to make it happen or make it easier? Maybe it would have landed up being different, but it really was an unpleasant experience and probably not much better for her either. I think being cognizant of the situations that we're getting into and sometimes, you know, that, that random time where it doesn't go so well is part of what happens when we do have those moments. It's how we react. And like you mentioned, when we were talking about this the other day, it could be how they react too. You know, it, it's not just on us all the time. It, sometimes it's on them and weighing that out. And I have a habit of just like talking to people. And sometimes even the strangers that confront me, by the end of it, we're talking, you know, just yapping away and, and kind of calm them down about what I do, how I do it in a sense. Usually you got a minute or two, so you have these elevator speeches and I usually draw from them. But I always wonder if after my interaction with that person where I had that educational moment, I wonder if they came to an intersection and just closed their eyes and stood there for like 30 seconds just to take it in to see what it's like. You mentioned the golden rules. What three golden rules would there be for society to know about when they come across us? And that's a great question for the listeners. Oh, isn't it just? Wouldn't it be great to have, you know, the three golden rules of a moment in time between a member of the BVI community and a sighted individual? It would be so great if we could just Put it down into three golden rules. And it would be good to, to hear other people's thoughts about what they felt would help. And I think one is probably Dr. Kavanaugh's just ask, don't grab. I, I think it is a, I don't think it's always, you know, there are situations where reaching out and grabbing someone is the only way to avoid a situation. But it's still one of the best, simplest rules that I've ever heard for how to avoid a situation going from 
a moment of high stress into a moment of danger. Because if we are focusing on our roots when we're navigating a space and we are focusing particularly in a, a high stress situation like a train station or bus, you know, any kind of high population with a lot of people around, we are mm-hmm. focusing on what we're doing. We're having to focus because there's a lot happening around us. And if suddenly someone reaches out and grabs us, that does potentially put us in danger. Suddenly we miss the factor at the top of the stairs and fall down it. That's potential. Well, that is dangerous. But I still think, you know, it's it is one of those times that perhaps there are instants when reaching out and grabbing someone is going to prevent the danger. Mm-hmm. I was walking with my guide dog and someone was yelling a couple of meters away from me going, no, stop, 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 stop. And I didn't know if she was talking to me, if she was talking to someone else. I didn't know if she wasn't being mugged, but she was actually concerned because I was approaching a down curb and she was worried that I was going to step off it, which wasn't the case. But, you know, she was doing the best that she could to attract my attention when in fact all she needed to do was reach out and touch and say, are you okay? Do you know there's a step in front of you? Mm Mm-hmm. But I'm getting distracted away from the point. It would be really great if we could have three simple rules. And yes, it would be fun to see what the listeners actually come up with that they think would be those ideal three or four or five. I think we're flexible enough to admit five golden rules for the interaction between ourselves and and the sighted community. Well, you brought up a really good point that that moment when just grab, don't ask comes into play. I was ready to go forward and the sidewalk was in front of me. But if you veered to the left, there were some steps that went down and a gentleman reached right across and barred me from moving forward. And I came to a sudden stop and he said, those are steps going down. And all of a sudden I took my cane and felt again and it was like a big void. (laughs) It's like, (laughs) whoa, thank you. I was just, I don't know what happened. I don't know why he was there, but I was glad he was there. So just grab, don't ask, <laughs> worked for me at that moment. But we're really talking about those intersections of when we come across a situation that we, like you said early on, we've all had them before. So what are the golden rules? We got one. I think we got one. I like the just ask, don't grab. You're right. Dr. Amy Cavanaugh's campaign reached around the world and it got over here. There's an interview I did with her and really good, really good explanation of why why she was excited about it because she was surprised that so many people attached that hashtag and they were glad she was talking about it. So good for Dr. Amy Kavanaugh on getting the word out there and getting the conversation going. Because part of me was like, are there people that are attracted to this? But to tell you the truth, some people are new at work or they're new to the cane like Dr. Amy Kavanaugh was, or they're new to the area and they're not as confident at that moment. Like I've lived in my Minneapolis area my entire life and well, so far my entire life. But I'm used to my travel. I have certain areas I go to. It's kind of a routine. So for anyone else that has just gained the mobility skills and starting to travel, you're probably going to encounter a lot more things because you're more exploring. And that's the big difference between traveling and exploring. When you're exploring, you're trying to figure out what's between points A and B or where is B. But when you're traveling, you're going through a routine. So you're probably just thinking about what you're going to cook for dinner, what you're going to do. And you're just going about your motions because that's what you do. So... Don't feel bad if you're just learning how to travel and you have more of these encounters because we've all been there. It happens. And learning the skills of kind of conversation and preventing that domino effect going in the wrong direction is how you react. I think is a good skill to develop is how to absorb it and take that step back. Like you said, Lois, take that breath, not to bite your tongue, but just take that breath and let it settle for just a second could really change the outcome. But be careful when taking that step back, because if you're taking a physical step back, you never know you might <laughs> fall off a curb. Now, I, I've also been in the same environment for a number of years, and I am very comfortable working with my guide dog in and around my home. But I never do that route on autopilot. There's always a part of me that's paying attention to what's happening around me, because you never know what's going to happen in the environment. 
when you're not looking around with your ears and your your senses, you know, suddenly something's changed. Someone's parked a car on the the sidewalk where there shouldn't be one, or I don't know. I have had some really bizarre things suddenly appear on my route that I walk practically every day, and I'm not gonna just go onto autopilot. I've got some friends who walk using a cane or with their guide dogs, listening to music through their earpods, and I'm like, no, I prefer to be able to listen to the world around me, the traffic around me, and everything else that might potentially suddenly leap up in front of me and yeah suddenly I'm in a different situation from where I thought I was so I don't believe that we ever can be totally on autopilot no matter how confident we are no matter how used to the route we are there's always got to be a bit that is paying attention to what's happening around us yeah I call it white white noise it used to be the white noise that just happens in life but when I lost some of my vision and everything I had to pay attention to that next layer of white noise and yeah you're right. It's not autopilot, but it's kind of a little bit more comfortable in your own area, your own street. And you never know. The next corner could be that person that wants to win their good deed for the day and help you. You, I don't want to say the helpless, but <laughs> <laughs> that word gets used. You might well get yourself into a whole lot of trouble using a term like that, because it's one thing we are not. And we know that as a exactly. community, but sadly, there are many people out there in the general public who truly believe that disability means disability. And no matter how much awareness raising we do, no matter how much we try to educate, inform, talk too nicely, it just doesn't sink in. But that's also part of being alive, being out there doing stuff and living a normal life. You know, we can't only choose to encounter certain types of people. You know, you've done a lot of speaking engagements, and some of them have been talking to children at schools, young children at schools, and you get those moments, five minutes. I, I know that your dog's the main attraction. Of course, that's the <laughs> question I get asked most. Can I play with your dog just now? Not right now. <laughs> but, yeah. but to to be able to interact with someone who's visually impaired, blind, and have a conversation with them and learn a little bit about them. Because when I lost my eyesight, I could not really, I tried to dig back and find any conversation or anything I knew about how a blind works in society, operates in society. Where do they keep them? I didn't know any of this stuff. So as children get to experience Lois, that's helping everybody else because now they started an interaction. It wasn't a cartoon. It wasn't TV. It wasn't a story. It was real life. I think it's also the, the greatest feedback I've had from the children's books that I've written, which are illustrated children's books aimed predominantly at this stage at sighted children, just explaining some of the techniques we use when we are walking around, doing mobility, doing things around the house, showing the different tools and techniques in a way that children can understand that, hey, just because someone's blind doesn't mean they're different. They just use different techniques. And it's been really fascinating to chat to children who have read my books and actually to their parents as well, to talk about the conversations that the books have started. And I think it's actually one of the reasons I love working with children is they are unafraid to ask the questions, where once people grow a little bit older, we kind of become a little more reticent about that. But I really do think that there's a huge need for this kind of awareness. And I suppose it's also why I wrote A Different Way of Seeing, because I realized amongst my own friends and family, people who'd known me for years and years and years, they didn't know how I did the simple everyday tasks in life. And it was feedback that I got from one of my speaking colleagues. She said, you know, you're talking about motivational, trying to give a motivational message about overcoming challenges. And yet your audience members are sitting there going, you just mentioned that you use a mobile phone, but how? And they sit there with that question sticking in their brain. So they miss the message that I'm giving them. And it really is simple tasks, simple techniques that the sighted community 
often don't understand. They don't have contact uh, with someone who is blind or visually impaired. And we need to recognize that part of our duty, our responsibility, in a sense, much as we may not like to, is to raise awareness so that we have fewer instances when we have those moments where someone just makes that assumption that just because we're visually impaired, we're unable to do anything. Exactly. And your book, A Different Way of Seeing, is available on Amazon? It is on Amazon, as are my children's books, and it will hopefully soon be available as an audio book as well. But that's not yet finished. Well, unless it takes that long for us to get this edited and published. (laughs) That's an SEP. That's not my job. (laughs) Lois, you just mentioned that people hear something that you use a mobile phone, and then they're not even paying attention to the message that you're sending. And I think sometimes that happens, too. When we're approaching, we I keep using this intersection, we're approaching a situation and a person may be seeing us for 10 seconds before we encountered it. I wonder what they're blocking out because we're just a little different that they don't know how this is going to work out. Watch out for the garbage can. Oh, watch out for the, oh, oh, they made it here, you know, but they've already blocked out, hey, this person probably came from seven miles away. Or, But that's a really good point. I think in the golden rules, I don't want to tell anybody what to put for their golden rule, but (laughs) it's one of those things that some of the sighted community are blocking some self out that we don't even realize that they don't even think we're capable of or have the confidence to do something, not confidence, but the capacity sometimes even to do something. So it's a really tough one to really say that we're going to come up with these golden rules that everyone's going to not abide by, but at least contemplate. Back in the day when I was doing my coaching diploma, one of the lecturers mentioned to us that we need to understand that people's perceptions are their reality. And I think for me, that really does kind of speak to this point, because sure, someone watching us navigate a really busy sidewalk may be astounded by the fact that we can navigate our way around a tree without knocking ourselves out. But that's based on their perception of what they understand disability blindness is. They don't, it's going to come out the wrong way, but they don't know any better. And there's a lot of research being done at the moment that as a species, humankind often takes a more negative interpretation of the facts than is warranted. So extracting from that, person X standing watching a blind person walking down a busy sidewalk may go, oh, that's going to be dangerous for them, when in fact we are looking confident, we're acting confident, we're walking at our normal walking speed, avoiding the obstacles that we know are not there, avoiding and navigating our way around those that we don't know that are there, but because we are comfortable in our skills that are not putting us in danger, there's still the perception that we are at risk blocks out the reality that that person is actually seeing. And very much perception does dictate our reality. The same actually holds for us, though, as the blind and visually impaired community, because There may be lots going on in the environment as we're walking that we're not aware of. And that can also play into this moment when a sighted person seems to appear out of nowhere and suddenly grab at us and and put us off our stride, so to speak. That's so true. I used to hate the sound of sprinklers. (laughs) It masks so much information when I was first learning. We did it under sleep shade, so we couldn't use any residual sight. And I would hear like refrigerator trucks, trucks that would park, but the refrigerator unit is just (laughs) going. It's like, do you shut that off? Or why is that (laughs) sprinkler going for a block and a half? I can hear this. Well, I was taking in all that information. I didn't learn how to block things out. So I hope I'm not blocking out a lot of stuff that even that the sighted people, I don't want to say sighted people, but even people out there that jump out at me, I hope I'm not blocking out like, oh, you you know, 
discounting them before I even hear what they have to say. And I, I don't know if it's pride or something like that. I'm willing to learn from a situation. So I think that's why I hung on to that cashier thing because I want to learn because I want to know when I'm in another situation, I hope that cashier situation pops into my head and makes me cautiously. <laughs> Maybe I'll turn my cane around and step back a step. <laughs> At least take a breath before I go into a lecture. I, I find out that anytime you start to lecture someone, you lose a lot of their <laughs> willingness to listen any further. That is that is probably true. And you know, I've, I'm also thinking that there's so much generally going on in everyone's lives that we tend to focus on our world, our environment, what we're up to, what we're doing. And I'm, I'm not talking about the, this isn't a, a, a blindness versus a sighted person thing. This is everybody. We focus first on what was important to us, what we're doing at the moment. I think people out there are actually more kind of focused on their own lives. And if they do observe someone walking past who happens to be blind or visually impaired, it's just observing briefly a moment in time and then they're gone. Um, but that's an entirely different conversation, isn't it? Yeah. If you dress up like a smartphone, you'll get a lot of people staring at you. That's what I think people are doing as they're walking along the sidewalks. They're just looking at the smartphones and, oh, blind person, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> I also wonder, actually, how, how much, I think you, you mentioned earlier that on social media, we often see a lot of the the posts coming out from a number of people who seem to experience challenges more often. And is it something that happens to them? I don't believe that. It happens to all of us. Maybe some people are more willing to talk about it than others. But also, I do wonder to what extent the culture in which we live plays a part. And, you know, I've, I'm often amazed that the area where I live, which is Cape Town. Cape Town's known to be a very laid back, kind of relaxed environment. And the people are fairly, just generally pretty nice. So, and I very seldom have problems when I'm out and about in my city. Occasionally, I may be stopped trying to take a guide dog into a restaurant. But I think of the, the three guide dogs, I think if it's happened, it's a handful of times. But I have other friends who live in other cities who seem to have problems every time they go out. And I think that there isn't a place or there's culture of the people, the environment also does play into this conversation as to the way other people respond. And I don't really know to what extent that dictates how often people encounter challenges. Well, that would be interesting to hear from people from different parts of the world, different societies, different cultures. You know, even a guide dog in Cape Town or Minneapolis has a different situation if you're in, let's say, India, Malaysia, Hawaii. There's so many different rules, so many different understandings of people. You know, their perception is their reality, and they may have been systemically or ingrained in them as they've grown up to believe certain things, or that blind vision impaired people are to be taken care of and it's honorable for the family to take care of. So there's so many different, hmm, are we lucky to be where we are? I think my perception is, yeah, you're lucky to be where you are, but it'd be nice to hear from other people, what is their situation? What does just ask, don't grab mean to them? And how does it play out in their culture? Is, is culture the right word? I, for me, yes, because culture speaks about the the values of a society, the norms of a society and things like that. So for me, yeah, I think it, for me, it's about culture, that different cultures have almost unwritten rules of behavior, of the, the values, the norms. So yeah, that does play into it. And I think this goes right back to what we said at the beginning. This seems like it's such a simple topic. Mm. One moment where two people engage, bump into each other, start having a conversation or not, start having some form of interaction. But when you actually dig down below the surface, there is so much going on. And that's what makes the whole thing so complicated. Because there's only so many of those factors that we ourselves can influence. 
we can only influence the factors that relate directly to ourselves to a degree, what is in the immediate environment around us, but we have no control over so many of the other things that are going on. And I think we need to just be aware of that and not take on the responsibility of feeling that we own the entire situation because very often it's completely out of our hands. And when we start thinking about this, that's when you mention analysis paralysis. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, there does come a point, and maybe I should take a step back and kind of explain to anyone who isn't familiar with that term. Analysis paralysis is often a corporate term. I don't really know of it being used beyond that, but I'm sure it probably is, where you dig into a, a topic or a conversation or a, a point, and it's so complex and you really start digging down into it to the extent that there's just so much information that you are paralyzed from taking a decision, taking an action. And I guess it is relevant to this conversation because there are, in those moments, there is just so many things going on that sometimes we may be paralyzed into what is the best response to the situation. And I am one of those people who I'm not particularly good when being suddenly confronted by something unexpected. So for me, my standard response when something is different or unexpected is I freeze, I stop. So for me, it, it, it's a very much the kind of an analysis paralysis. It's the, oh my goodness, what's just happened? And I'm not taking another step until I've sorted it out in my own mind so that I know that I'm safe. So that's why for me it, it is relevant as a phrase when we're talking about this conversation. And it's been a great conversation, Lois. I want to thank you for coming on and talking about this. And this is something that I really hope other people, other people, what other people? <laughs> this is actually something I think the listeners would comment back give us some input what's your golden rule that you wish was out there that society would understand and you can tweet us there's at blind abilities do you have a twitter handle i do it's at lois strachan z a and z is z <laughs> okay lois strachan <laughs> z a that's the the international code for south africa z a z a that's great. And you can also find your podcast, A Different Way of Traveling, with two L's. And you also have a blog. I do. It's on my website, www.loisstrachen.com. All right. We'll put all the links in the show notes. And this will be a continuing discussion on this, I'm sure, because we'll probably get some messages in. And the analysis paralysis is not permanent. We will keep moving on with this topic. <laughs> I hope so. I think it really would be great to get feedback from people from different parts of the world because, yeah, our experiences are so diverse and we can learn from each other. And I think that's one of the best ways for us to learn. That's right. And I think, too, in your travels, you travel quite a bit and stuff. You've learned. I mean, that's a whole nother podcast, but <laughs> it'd be good information to learn about certain areas. You know, like when you travel to a, a certain place a lot of people want to know about the food places to see but what is the culture like for a blind person that's an interesting topic and as you say that is an entirely different conversation all right lois well thank you very much and we'll see you on the next one it's been great to chat to you jeff a blind abilities production music by Chichao, Chichao, Chichao. When we share what we see through, through each other's, each other's eyes, eyes, we can then, we can then begin, begin to bridge the gap between the limited, limited expectations and the reality, and the reality of blind abilities. Of blind abilities. Of blind abilities. Of blind abilities.
For more podcasts with a blindness perspective, check us out on the web at www.blindabilities.com, on Twitter at BlindAbilities, download our app from the App Store, BlindAbilities, that's two words, or send us an email at info at blindabilities.com. Thanks for listening.